cloud right now. And I will pass the mic to Jean Pierre Bouts. I know many of you don't need the, uh, me to introduce him, but we really have a national and international treasure. Uh, and it's very, very unique that Dr. Sbouts, with all his um, renowned projects, agreed to spend Saturday every three months to teach us how to publish our work. And just before I pass the mic, I wanted to see if Dr. Albert wanted to say a few words. Um, no, I don't need to say anything. I prefer to hear from Jean-Pierre. I am very excited, however, at the number of people who have attended these workshops because fielding students produce phenomenal research. I never cease to be amazed at the rigor and excellence of the research coming out of fielding. And this kind of work being disseminated more broadly is just so important. So I'm thrilled that Jean-Pierre is willing to support us and continue to help us. And that's why I started this endowment is to make sure that he feels handcuffed to fielding. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Pauline. Thank you, uh, Elena. Well, let's go. And it's wonderful to see this, uh, this community uh, on Zoom this morning uh, in the middle of the night in Australia. Uh, and so let's uh, let's get started. Uh, I just want to make sure that uh, everybody can see the screen. Yep. Yes, we can. Very good. So, um, you know, in principle, if you have written a dissertation or a master's thesis at Fielding, there's no reason why you couldn't publish it. In my day, I did my dissertation uh, in 1979. Uh, uh, based on work uh, that I did at Columbia University in New York. Uh, and at that time, there were no publishing opportunities, even though um, State University of New York expressed uh, an interest in publishing my dissertation, which was about an architectural firm of the late 19th century called Career and Hastings that I'm sure none, none of you have ever heard about. <laughs> um, and then uh, Ronald Reagan uh, was sworn in and uh, he, the first thing he did, among the first things he did, was cut the budget <laughs> and the federal support for uh, state universities. So out, out went my book. Uh, and and it, it, it's an interesting thing to think of. You know, my dissertation was then uh, distributed uh, in those days on microfiche. And uh, if you wanted to read a dissertation, you had to go to the library. And uh, if they happen to have a microfiche, you could you could see it, you know, on on one of those old machines, you know, they were very hot in the summer, and you could roll the film, and you could read the dissertation. Um, and I always want to remember that to underscore the fact that you, all of you on this call, have such tremendous opportunities to publish your work that didn't exist in the 1970s. Uh, and so in the, in the 50 years that have passed since then, it's scary to think about it. Um, you all now have tremendous opportunities to get your work out uh, in electronic form, in print form. And that is the subject of this uh, particular seminar. We're going to talk about, okay, you have a manuscript. You think the manuscript is good. You know what your readership is going to be. You know the unique aspects, the unique selling proposition, as we call it, of your manuscript. How are you going to get it out the door? How are you going to get it published? And today, 2022, the opportunities for that are boundless. And that's the subject of today's seminar. Then we're going to, we're going to reconvene uh, one more time this year in December. Uh, and at that time, we're going to talk about, okay, let's assume that you're going to publish your book, that you have a publisher or you have a publishing gateway, or you have, you have uh, independently published your book. How are you going to promote it? And that is as important as publishing your book, because every day right now, because of the opportunities that exist to publish your work, every day, thousands of new 
ebooks and printed books are published. I'm talking every day, thousands, I'm not exaggerating. So it's extremely important that in addition to knowing how to publish your book, you then also know how to promote the book so that your book can rise above the, uh, the tremendous outpouring of books that we, that we have today. So let's get started on this. And I always want to start with a little bit of a, 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 a recap of what we did over the last two workshops. Very briefly, I won't take a lot of time, but for those of you who are joining this workshop for the first time, I just wanted to have a quick recap of what it is. The first question you have to ask yourself is, is your work publishable? And of course it is, but uh, the important question that you need to articulate for yourself and for your publisher, if you do a book proposal, is what new and unique insights has your study produced? Now, those of you uh, for whom I had the privilege of serving on your dissertation committee, I always warn that that's a question that I will ask during the FOR. <laughs> and very often, even though I warn you, very often when I actually ask the, the student during an FOR, now tell me in 30 or one minute, what unique, new and unique insights has your study produced? Sometimes, uh, many times, students struggle with the answer because they can't see the forest through the trees. You've been so immersed in the minutiae of your dissertation and all the data, all the data that you created, that it's very difficult for you to distill the unique elements of your dissertation. What have you contributed to the academy that we didn't know before your study was produced? What new and exciting things have you found? It is so important. This is the starting point from, for any publishing venture that you may have considered. Just to just recap, recapitulate for yourself. What makes my manuscript unique and special? What is it that the world needs to know that the world didn't know before? So that's exercise number one. Then the second question is always, what type of readers will be interested in those findings? Where am I going to target my book on? And that becomes very important when we start talking about promoting the book, which we will do in December. What kind of a, what's the profile of the reader who is going to learn about my book and say, oh, oh I, I have to read that. Who is that person? Is that person in the public sector or the private sector? Is that person in management? Is that person in leadership? Is that person uh, middle management? Or am I targeting uh, people outside their workspace? Are we talking people who are interested in social change? All those questions you have to filter out because these are the questions that your publisher will ask you when you come with a proposal. And then are there, what are the practical outcomes that readers can take away uh, when reading your, your book, whether they're academics or professionals or just general population. What are the practical outcomes? That's a question that I ask myself every time when I write a book. And I think uh, it's next month, I think um, it's my 27th or my 28th book. <laughs> I got to do a proper count. But I, I've written many books, but I always ask myself, who is going to pick up this book and what can they learn from it that they don't know already? So these are three things that you have to distill and articulate in very pithy language as part of your pitch to any publisher. And, and even if you decide to publish independently, you still need to know this because that's how you're going to focus the whole presentation of your book, okay? Uh, and we've talked about this in my previous workshops, but I just want to reiterate again, you cannot publish your dissertation as is. That is absolutely a sine qua non. The, the way you've structured your dissertation or the way we forced you to structure your dissertation as an introduction, as a literature review, as a methods analysis, as a data report, 
as a data interpretation and then conclusions, the whole reason why these, these elements are siloed as completely separate elements is so that we as faculty can determine whether the student is able to craft an introduction, whether you, you know how to handle a lib review, you can design a methods project, you can collect your data and report your data. All of these are separate functions and tasks that we as your faculty must adjudicate in order to determine whether you are ready to become a doctor, doctoral student or an EDD or a PhD. And so that is a very artificial way of presenting, telling your story. And in previous seminars, and they're recorded so you can uh, revisit them if you want. It is so important for you to realize that you must recast your dissertation entirely. I call it inversion, to invert the information so that you create a compelling story from the beginning of end that tells the story of your research. And specifically, every chapter has to have a mix of story of literary references, of primary data, that's the data that you uh, discovered as part of your research, and just-in-time data. Now, the just-in-time data, we talked about it in the, my last seminar, is extremely important. What are just-in-time data? Just-in-time data are, are uh, reports, primary reports that you can find in leading newspapers, such as the New York Times, leading magazines such as The Economist, because these are data sets captured today or just in the last week. Very often, literature that you use in your dissertation is several years old, sometimes as much as a decade old. I've seen dissertations that refer to sources from the 1960s and 70s. You know? And so it is extremely important that you balance that even your own data, which may already be, you know, six or nine months old, with just-in-time data that you can find readily available just by reading the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Chicago Tribune, or The Economist. You know, I, as you know, for me, I, I swear by The Economist because it is the best month, uh, weekly periodical I know of. It captures the world in every facet, politics, economics, culture, literature, uh, social change. It is an incredible snapshot of what happened in the world in the past week. And uh, there's a special uh, student rate, if you're still a student. Um, usually the subscription is about $150, $175 a year, which sounds a lot, but let's face it, for the rich, data that you get, it's absolutely without parallel. And so you must also have just-in-time data just to make sure that your book is timely and up to speed, especially if you've written your dissertation several years uh, before. So rather than having a silo with introduction and literature review and methods design, your book has to capture the attention of the reader right from the get-go by having that mix right from the start. And you can do that in many ways. If you, for one way that we discussed uh, to uh, scaffold your, your book is if you interview, let's say 10 interesting people, uh, you can make each of those people a case study and individual chapter. Uh, people who write, clinical psychologists who write about their case studies often do that, they make you know, they're, they have worked with a patient called, let's call her patient X, and patient X has chapter one, patient Y has chapter two. Uh, that's one way of doing it. There are many other ways of doing it. You can segment it by topic. You can seg segment it by theme. The important thing is no matter how you slice and dice your book, each chapter must have that unique mix of story, literary references, primary data and just-in-time data so that you can frame and support and bolster the argument 
that you make. And of course, every chapter is an argument with the evidence that you have present. You know, whatever you claim, whatever you argue, it must have that, uh, that, 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 ground, that, that grounding in evidence. Now, the extent to which you use literature is of course driven again by the first questions you ask yourself, who's the reader? If you target academics, you want those literature references to be very prominent. If you target practitioners, you want the emphasis to be on your data, not so much on literature. Professionals, practitioners don't usually do a lot of literature. It may be interesting to once and again refer to it, but a practitioner will really lean more towards the validity of primary data and just in time data than in literature, whereas the academic will want to see more theory. I mean, we all know that, we all understand that. But these are all decisions that you have to make as, you're, as you write your book. And then it's important that you translate your findings into tangible real world ideas. And I mentioned real world ideas because at Fielding, I, I think sometimes we emphasize theory a bit too much at the, at the expense of practice. Um, you know, I taught in the School of Psychology uh, for many years, for 10 years, Fielding School of Psychology, and they understand that. And so in the School of Psychology, what they do is they have you do practica before you're even allowed to begin your dissertation. And with, during the practica, you are forced to deal with real patient data, real clinical data, uh, primary data that you work with a practitioner or an internist or a psychologist to deal with real life data. And based on that, you start to know, you start to understand uh, the importance of relating data to literature and to real life ideas. I, I've often clamored, I've not been successful. I've often clamored for SLS, the School of Leadership Studies, to do the same thing. Before we let our students loose on a dissertation, uh, let's first teach them how to work with data, which I don't think we do enough. Uh, it's sort of like throwing somebody in the deep and saying, now learn how to swim. <laughs> you have to learn how to create a data system and a data collection system, even though you've never done it before. That's not the way to do it. In Europe, we do it very, very differently where students are rigorously trained in, in developing data collection systems and interpreting data before they can do their dissertation as I can attest to the many scars, but uh, um, that's just the way, it is. that's just here and there. Anyways, important thing is make sure that whatever you write resonates with the practical value for the reader. These are takeaways that the reader uh, finds valuable. And as I said earlier, the best way to start a book like that, so inverting your dissertation into a whole new book, which of course has all the information in your dissertation, but is presented in a very different way, is to develop a, a table of contents. If I wanted to invert my dissertation into an interesting book, what would a table of contents look like? Start with the headers of each of the 10 chapters, let's call it 10 chapters for argument's sake. What would the title of each chapter be? That's the first ex exercise. And then when you know when you feel good about that breakdown, then write a little paragraph under each of those headers. What am I going to talk about in this chapter? And when you have that, now you're already halfway into your book proposal. And so that's how organically you can create that book proposal. Uh, it's important, again, that you do not copy and paste from your dissertation. Please don't do that. It, it will become a kludge. It, I've seen that in, early, in the very early beginning of our Field University Press when we published people's dissertations as part of a collection, a bundle of multiple students' work. I've seen people basically compress their article by just copying and pasting from a dissertation. And, and, it became such a kludge, I have to send it back. I said, I, I, can't, uh, I can't follow what you're, what you're talking about because this is clearly 
constipated language. <laughs> you know, that's really the only way you can. Uh, so it has to be written afresh with an authentic narrative arc. It's important to do that. Yes, it's a little bit of work, but I, I challenge you to do that because you will find it very refreshing to really rethink what you have done with your dissertation and to write a story, a story about that dissertation research that will appeal to other people. Always avoid long run, run on sentences. I see that so often. You know, sentences that go on for line after line after line with sub clauses and halfway you lose complete track of what you're saying. You know, the, the art of scholarly writing is talking about complex ideas with simple language. That's my mantra. You know, and I apply that in my own books. The art of scholarly writing is articulating very complex ideas in simple language. If you can do that, then you really grab your audience. Avoid jargon, you know, avoid jargon. Sometimes I see people dissertations with lots of abbreviations and what is that? Well, you, yeah, the, the, this faculty knows, but who is your reader going to understand that? So avoid that, avoid abbreviations, avoid jargon. You're trying to persuade your readers. You're not trying to impress them. Don't try to impress your readers with your knowledge. People will be turned off by that real, real quick. You need to persuade them. You need to inspire them, okay? That's really what's so important. Now, before we go on to the traditional book proposal, are there any questions about this, what we've just discussed? Any questions? Feel free to pipe up. Dr. Uh, is Boots, I, I may be misreading things. I, I'm David Zuniga. There was some discussion in the chat about maybe, I guess, proposal slots being open in September and someone said to ask you, but that also books were selected. I don't know if I'm jumping the gun on that. Yeah, you're jumping the gun a little bit. All right, sorry, sorry, we're, sorry. We're gonna talk about that in a minute. Yes, I know. Okay, sorry, sorry. I can, I can tell you how many emails I've got. Is there a September one deadline? Uh, we're gonna talk about that in a minute. I just wanna make sure that what we've just discussed in these last 15 minutes really has settled in your brain. Because if we don't adhere to these guidelines, then there is no point in writing a book. There really isn't. This must be the essential framework for your book. I want your book to be successful. I want your book to be read. I want your book to be written up by book critics and reviewers. These are the essential ingredients of doing that. Okay. Any any final questions about that? Okay. And I have you're... a question. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I'm going back to the very beginning when you were talking about beyond the unique selling proposition, understanding the unique promotion that you're going to be looking at here and your target audience. Can you speak a little bit more about that in terms of the variety of either audiences or platforms uh, that you would see related to some of this work? Absolutely. And it, the thing is, this is a question that your publisher will ask. It's probably the first question that your publisher will ask is who's going to read this? And you who have written the dissertation probably knows better than anyone else who's going to be in, uh, interested in this. You know, if you, if you wrote about coaching, you know, very often your target will be leaders. But then even there, we want to know what, what are these leaders? Uh, are these small companies? Are these large companies? Are these public companies and private companies? By the way, that is a pet peeve of mine uh, that very often students don't make a distinction in writing about leadership between public and private companies. And again, that's where I fault our, uh, our, our, our emphasis on theory rather than practical case studies, because you will find I've, I've worked for both private and public companies in my career, and you will find that the dynamic of those two company types are, is extremely different. You know, a public company uh, is constrained by so many things. Uh, not only by law, but also by the sheer size and responsibilities of an organization. A private company is an entirely different animal. So please, 
if you write about leadership as one example of answering your question, always make a clear distinction between whether you're writing about private companies or public companies, which is something that I, I always miss in, in dissertation on the subject. But to answer your question, the, the reason why a publisher will ask you who is going to read your book is because they need to quantify in their mind whether uh, what, as, what the risk element is of publishing your book. How many people read, read your book? Um, it is a, uh, basically a uh, given in academic publishing, for example, that um, if you sell 500 copies, it's considered a, a fairly good accomplishment. In commercial publishing, that book would be <laughs> considered a failure. You know? um, in commercial publishing, if you sell 5,000, people will start to sit up. If you sell 10,000, people will start to smile. And when you sell 50,000, confetti will rain down from heaven. You know? So that is why it's so important for you to be able to articulate who is going to read this book? And you should try to uh, articulate that as, as specifically as possible. You know, for example, uh, if I, I, my, the, my book that's coming out uh, is the, in September is the, uh, the evolution of uh, Leonardo's uh, work, the evolution of Leonardo's painting. I think it's called the uh, elusive uh, evolution of Leonardo's art. And in it, I intend to upset the apple cart of Leonardo's scholarship. Uh, I like to do that sometimes. And uh, I completely uh, dispute the established canon of when and why and where Leonardo painted, Leonardo da Vinci painted his artwork. Uh, that's based on my discovery that he painted two Mona Lisas instead of one, that he painted two uh, Last Supper paintings instead of one. And so based on that, I'm able to completely upstage that apple card. Now, the question is, who's going to read that? And I could easily have written this book for a small group of art historians who no doubt will rip it to shreds <laughs> or have some severe criticisms. And I might sell two, three, four hundred books. But I deliberately wrote the book for the general reader, for a college educated uh, person who is interested in art, who travels, who visits museums. You see what I'm saying? So it's sort of a behavioral profile that you want to uh, create. And it, it, it's, it's specifically important not only for publishers, but also for your reviewers, because there is nothing more powerful for you to promote your book than to get a review. We'll talk about that in December. The, the, for me, for my books, the, the most powerful uh, influence, impact I've ever seen, for example, last year I wrote a book called Mapping America, which is telling the story of the birth of America through maps, which was nobody's ever done that. Uh, you know, you use maps sort of as the photography of the era and uh, together with uh, a wonderful map collector in Florida who had, who had the physical maps. And the New York Times said, wrote, this is one of four books you have to read this week. Now, that doesn't happen all the time. But of course, when that came out, uh, you know, my feet didn't touch the floor for a couple of days. You know, <laughs> That's wonderful when the New York Times writes about your book that way. Now, I'm not saying you're going to have to get a New York Times book review, but I've had reviews in smaller periodicals, and you see an immediate uptick, up, uh, uptick in the sales, uh, which you can track. We'll talk about that in December. You can track your sales uh, uh, when these things come out. So it's a very long answer to your question, but I hope I have sort of sketched the, the importance of identifying your reader. There is one other, I see a hand here and a, and a plant. Uh, Lisa, Lisa, go ahead. Hello, thanks for your presentation uh, today. Overall, so when you're writing for a general or broader audience, how do you know maybe what is enough context to give without 
overwhelming and without providing too much jargon or information in general, the, the right amount or ideal amount of information for someone who's new to the field or outside of the topic? Well, you sort of answered the question yourself by knowing who you want to write for. If you want to target leaders, let's call it that way. I mean, I'm, I'm very uncomfortable with that term, but it's sort of, you know, the school of leadership study. So we have to go with it. Uh, people obviously in executive functions, then the question becomes, um, what are these ex executives expecting? You know, it's very difficult. And I was in my, I had a corporate part of my career was corporate. I ran a very large multinational organization based in London for several years. And uh, did I go through airport? I was traveling a lot in those days. And when, when did I go through an airport and see a book, leadership studies, how to become a better leader? No, I, I stayed away from those books because nobody was going to tell me how to be a better leader because I believe that I faced un unique challenges that many leaders, other leaders did not. So what you have to do is present your book in such a way that says, by the way, Mr. or Mrs. Leader, uh, here are some really important takeaways that will help you to function better in your position. And that's what you have to determine for yourself. Who is that person? Who is that she or he who obviously has executive responsibilities, uh, but needs to figure out a better way of doing that. And it comes back to my comment that I mentioned earlier, is that in our dissertations, we don't spend enough time on the practical aspects of leadership. We tend to be so overwhelmed by theory, and theory is important, don't get me wrong. Theory is important, but how do you translate theory into practical, day-to-day -day challenges that today's leaders are confronting. If you can articulate that, if you can somehow in your title, we're gonna talk about that, in your presentation, uh, if you can articulate that, these are some of the things that you face in your day-to-day -day position. And these are elements that I think will help you to better perform in that position then you have a good book. And then the question of how much theory should I introduce versus how much practical data should be introduced becomes self-evident. And as I said earlier, if you target professionals, if you target executives, then literature references may be interesting, but the emphasis should be on practical data. Uh, an executive, a modern executive today, We'll want to see what co company X is doing, what company Y is doing. He will want, she or he will want to see statistical data a lot more than, for example, theories written by someone five or 10 years ago. If you want to write for an academic audience, the opposite is true. You want to be able to make a theoretical argument that can stand on the shoulders of all those who've gone before you. So that's why, again, identifying the target reader of your book is critical for everything that flows from there. Okay. All right. Anyone? Any other questions on that topic? All right. Move on here. We're going to have a little break, uh, coffee break, potty break, whatever you want to call it, uh, in uh, in about twenty five minutes. So this is the traditional book proposal. And this applies to everything, whether you target a traditional publisher, a commercial publisher, whether you target a university press, such as Fielding University Press, or any other publishers that you want to approach for your book. This is, these are the essential ingredients of a book proposal, a book outline, which again, going back to my first slide, targets who's going to read it, What's unique about my book? What is the essential takeaway from my book? Okay, who's reading it? What it's about? What makes it special? And what's the essential takeaway? The book specifications. Um, this is uh, it's going to be three hundred pages. This is important for a publisher to know because that is all related to cost. Again, to cost. 
page count, if you, if you know it. Uh, what makes the book unique and timely? Why should I publish this book at this point? Uh, does, it, does it lock into something that is very much in the news today? That If you can do that, that's always wonderful. You know. um, uh, what is your target audience again? Uh, and this is very important. What are the competitive publications on this topic? Do a little bit of research and say, what are other books on this topic? And talk a little bit about those books. Um, have they sold much? And again, if you use, if you're an Amazon user, you can track the sales of that book. Uh, what is the price point of that book? Um, what target, what, how it does it profile itself? Now you don't necessarily have to read each and every book that are competitors to your book, but you can certainly look for summaries or book reviews of that book, which is a very simple way of getting a little uh, summary. And then when, when you cite those competitive publications, and you don't need to do more than, than three or four, five at the outmost, but talk a little bit about those books because that will tell the publisher, oh, she's really schooled in her field. She really understands her field. And so it's extremely important to have those competitive publications in your book proposal. So it bolsters your credibility as an author that you know what other authors have written about it. You know? It's another thing that we don't do in our dissertations, which I think we should. And finally, your credits. Now, if you don't have, if you've never published before, that's okay. You can just talk about your research, your credentials, your degrees. That's fine. You know, um, don't talk about, you know, I have two cats and I like to go skiing. And you know, we don't want to hear that. I've seen that sometimes in author bios. Oh, I love knitting. And I, you know, we don't need to hear that. But professional credits, you know, what have you done career wise? So it doesn't always have to be about books or articles that you've published. If you have published articles or books, great, place it in there. But more or less talk about you as a professional person, okay? You as an authority in your field. And then it's always wonderful to include one or two sample chapters. The reason for that is that Publishers want to see if you can write. <laughs> you know, it's very simple. Can she write? Can he write? Can she make an argument? Does she write fluently, persuasively? Is it wonder? I mean, is it is it is it easy to follow along what you're saying? Which comes back to the point of argumentation. You're going to have to look at some of our earlier seminars to talk about that. But I am a great, great proponent of courses on argumentation. Unfortunately, at Fielding, we don't have that. And I, while I was still full-time faculty, I gave a course on argumentation. But the argumentation is sine qua non of writing dissertations. It has nothing to do with writing per se. Writing is the knowledge of grammar and being able to write and do all those things. Argumentation is the art of, of telling a story bolstered by evidence in such a way that your reader is going to agree with what you're saying, <laughs> you know, that's argumentation. Very, very, very important. So add one or two sample chapters, if at all possible. You don't have to read the whole, write the whole damn manuscript, but one or two sample chapters, each about 15 pages long, uh, 15 to 20 pages long. So a publisher has an opportunity to really sit there and, and read your work and say, ah, she really writes well. That's really, really, really great. Okay, any questions about this? No, okay. Always feel free to interject. There will be a Q and A, of course, as we said. Um, no, traditional publish. So you want to publish your book. Now, traditionally in my day, that meant going with hat in hand to uh, uh, a publisher, in my case, my first publisher, SUNY Press. Uh, and in those days, and even to this day, uh, you submit a book proposal 
through a literary agent. Now, there are some small publishers out there, and I know of some of my students who've been successful in getting their work published through one of those smaller publishers. But really, the big five, which is now rapidly becoming the big three, and it's terrible, this conglomeration in the United States of publishers. I mean, there used to be literary tens and if not more than a hundred publishers, and he's all been consolidated in these, these soon, unless the lawsuit fails, the, the government is suing uh, Simon Schuster and Penguin merging. But if, if they don't merge, still, there will be four colossal publishers. And it's very frustrating. I, I had a, a pitch to, with my agent uh, to, uh, I, I better not say the publisher name, but it was a, a, a really big publisher, one of the big four. And uh, I had a, I pitched my book, um, which was called, uh, it was targeted for the election cycle. And it was called Jesus in America, which basically uh, is, is about the, uh, the whole conglomeration, the merging of Christianity with political right wing and why in the process, the teachings of Jesus are completely distorted, if not ignored. And that book, uh, this particular publisher was terribly excited about in the way I presented it. And so we had a wonderful Zoom meeting and it took an hour and they asked questions and, uh, oh, this is fantastic. We, we want this book and it's gonna be great. And when can you have it ready? end of November, oh, okay, yeah, we can work with that. Everything is wonderful. Two weeks later, my agent called me, didn't make it, they passed. And I said, what the heck, what the heck happened? And they said, it had to go through the multiple layers of the organization, not in the olden days, and somewhere down the line, some idiot mixed it. There you go. So publishing a book through the four big ones, uh, in the United States right now, unless you are a best-selling author. And I actually am a best-selling author. My, my book sold to over 2 million copies. But uh, right now, because they are major media companies, the risk assessment is so incredibly important because these companies trade on Wall Street. They are big, mega love media companies. And they're so concerned about their quarterly earnings that their risk, that their level of risk, their sensitivity to risk is virtually nil. They will only bank on established stars, which is exactly why the government is suing Simon and Schuster, because it will only get worse if these publishers continue to consolidate. And so that's why if you want to be uh, uh, published by one of these major publishers, you have to have a literary agent who can sort of uh, lead you through it. I had a literary agent for many, many years, Peter Miller, uh, and he passed away uh, in October of last year, which was terrible. He was a dear friend of mine. And we talked at least once a day and uh, he had cancer and it, he just fought so such a valiant battle and he passed away. Right now I have a wonderful new uh, literary agent, but uh, she has to work very hard in today's uh, uh, environment. Anyways, if you wanna work with a literary, uh, with such an uh, agent, uh, they receive hundreds of submissions every week. Peter always complained that he had so much paperwork to work for and what he would do is he would hire high school students or college students to read those manuscripts for him. And of course, because there were so many stacks of manuscripts, uh, they were sort of psychologically incentivized to find something wrong with it. So that Peter didn't have a large stack at the end of the week, he only had like five or six. So it's a very difficult process to go through. Um, and then even if you submit to a publisher, that rarely results in acceptance unless your book is highly topical. You know, you have dirt on the Kardashians or something like that, you know. To this day, I'm trying to figure out what is up with these Kardashians, frankly? If there ever was manufactured celebrity, 
here it is. I mean, I look at these stories and say, who cares? Why would anyone care? But that's it. It's all about celebrity these days. So unless you develop the cure for cancer, unless you are in the news every day or you have dirt on Trump or something like that, it's going to be very difficult to get published uh, through a traditional publisher. And then even if you get accepted, it will typically take a year and a half for your book to be published. That's how long it takes to get published by a traditional publisher. And if you're lucky, you might get around 5% of net revenues and royalties. So what I'm telling you is that traditional publishing in our world, in the traditional, in the academic world of, of publishing dissertations, is not gonna get you very far. You may be lucky. You may, be, you may just have something so unique and special that you can burn through those obstacles and, and, and get there. And, and right now I, we're negotiating with, uh, with a publisher that's not part of the big four about another um, uh, book, that, a book series actually that I pitched and we have hopes, my, uh, my agent and I have hopes that that will finally make the cut but it is extremely difficult, even for an established author like myself, to burn through the layers of obstacles. So the, the, let's look at two alternatives. One is university presses, and the other is um, independent publishing. So, uh, and about university presses, the, let's talk about Fielding University Press, which is, I would say, typical of a, um, university press. Now, university presses, with some exceptions, tend to favor their own students and faculty. It's obvious. You know, Michigan University Press typically publishes works by Michigan faculty and alumni, unless there is something so incredibly special that they say, you know, yeah, you can do that. Oxford University Press is a typical example, and it's a rare example of a university press breaking out into commercial publishing. Oxford University Press is very broad. Uh, Karen Shackelford, who is faculty at Fielding, she's a wonderful friend of mine. She publishes her books with Oxford University Press. Um, I tried to get one her last book, but she went to the competition. <laughs> uh, and Oxford University Press is uh, one of uh, those ones that, that Sage Press uh, also tries to broaden itself out, or even though they're really uh, more more clearly academic. Um, but they, they, they tend to you know favor their own clan as they should, because they obviously are funded by the university, and the same with us. We, we uh, are very much, our mission is to publish the work of our faculty and our alumni. Um, it, it was for a long time, just faculty working with students. Uh, and uh, we typically publish somewhere between five and six new books per year, which is a lot for a small university press like ourselves. But uh, Pauline Albert, as, as Elena just told us, established last year, the Fielding Endowment for Lifelong Learning, which is a wonderful initiative. And uh, we're still uh, accepting donor donations to that fund, which will allow us to co-fund um, two to three books from alumni per year. And uh, uh, per year is sort of a, uh, an interesting concept because um, we now know how long it takes people to write the manuscript. Sometimes it's just three to six months. Uh, sometimes it's a year or more. So it's a bit difficult for us to keep that in our fiscal financial projections, but this is what we do. And that's the purpose. So if you would like to present your book to Fielding University Press, uh, there are a few recommendations that we have for you. It's important that your work is endorsed. And that's not just our university press, it's every university press. So it's important that your work, in addition to yourself as a, as a scholar, finds an endorsement by a prominent expert in your field. And that person 
should ideally write a preface. I'll show you an example in a minute. Uh, who, who is that expert? Well, ask your external examiner, for example. You know, your external examiner is obviously an expert in your field. Uh, I assume you uh, have or had a good relationship with that uh, external examiner. So maybe ask her or him to write a preface. It doesn't have to be, you know, it could be a page or two, that's it. It doesn't have to be a whole story but just a page or two that has some nice words to say about your book and about you as a scholar is, is really very important, not just for us, but for you too, to find an endorsement for your work. Um, we also expect our author, and this goes for every publisher, by the way, this is not just us, every publisher will tell you this, that you must be prepared to actively promote your book on your social media, at academic events, at Christmas parties, at cocktail parties, at bar mitzvahs, you know, whatever the case may be. Be a proponent, be an evangelist of your book. And, um, you know, I can tell you National Geographic, when I write for National Geographic, there is a clause that says, you know, author commits to actively promoting the book on social media. So we do the same. Of course, we will do our part using our own social media and feeling LinkedIn, Facebook, all that good stuff, our own website, our FUP website. But we ask you to share in that effort and actively promote the book, which we'll talk about in December. If accepted, and this is the always where eyebrows show, uh, go up, uh, we are very unique in that we adhere to open access principles in publishing. So once we recoup the investment in your book, and we're talking about copy, we, you know, we pay for copy editing, we pay for a review, we pay for uh, layout production, uh, the publishing process itself, we all pay for that. And once all those costs are recouped, then you and we share royalties on a 50-50 basis, which is very generous. Uh, not many uh, university presses will do that, let alone commercial publishers. So that's, that's how uh, we do that. Uh, here is the first book that was published under the new, uh, basically the, the, the new foundation of the uh, Endowment for Lifelong Learning established by Dr. Pauline Albert. This is our first alumna book and was so proud of Laura McGuire. Uh, she had her manuscript ready. So uh, we were able to publish this book uh, last July, uh, even though the endowment was only established basically at the end of last year. So as you can see, uh, here it is, our first alumna book, Sexual Misconduct Prevention Guidebook, based on her dissertation, but a lovely book. I, I, I encourage you to buy it uh, because you will learn so much about not only how Laura converted her dissertation into an extremely readable and accessible and engaging book, but also to see how we handle that. It's beautifully laid out by professional layout artists, cover design by professional artists, the whole presentation is, is beautifully done. So anyway, if, uh, if you wanna get a sense of what all this involves uh, and you wanna pitch to FUP, uh, I would encourage you to get a copy from Amazon of Laura McGuire's Sexual Misconduct Prevention Guidebook for Colleges for Higher Education. Great, terrific book. And we're so proud of her that we were able to do that. Um, so, the annual deadline, and I'm, I'm moving on so many emails about this. The, we have an annual deadline, which is May 1st, which doesn't mean that we won't look at submissions uh, submitted in April. It just means that after May 1, we have an editorial meeting and it involves all the people on our editorial board. And we review all the proposals. What I do is I read all the proposals I give recommendations to our editorial board and I have a seat on that board as well. And then together we decide 
what is good for the press and what is good for the author. And so we then pick two or sometimes three books that we accept and that we will, will publish. And when that happens, uh, we, we, uh, we have a contract that spells out all of those terms and we get to work. You submit to fup at fielding.edu. You can also submit to myself personally, which is jisvouts at fielding.edu. Uh, but if you don't know me or my email address, uh, just fup at fielding.edu and we'll get into my uh, mailbox. Now, it's so an annual intake of May 1st. However, uh, of um, the books that we accepted during our last intake last May, since then, two alumni authors have dropped out for various reasons. I, I shouldn't comment on that, various reasons, personal or otherwise. So we actually have two opportunities right now to fill those slots. So that's why, by exception, we will schedule another intake by September 30th of this year. So if you wanna submit a book ahead of our next intake of May 1st, 2023, you can, and you have it basically together, all those things that we talked about, uh, then uh, you can certainly welcome to submit your book proposal, provided it is developed as we just discussed. And you can also uh, find the author guide, the Fielding University Press author guide on <clears throat> Hillary's alumni website. Uh, if you cannot access website or whatsoever, write me an email at fup.feeling.edu or jisbas at feeling.edu. And I'll be happy to send you that author guide where that whole proposal is spelled out in detail and it also tells you all about formatting your manuscript. Uh, so uh, by all means, if you think you're ready, uh, you would like to be considered by Field University Press, uh, send me that by, by September 30th. Author manuscripts, again, must fully abide by the formatting. Now, you probably wonder why are they so strict about format. The reason is that we publish both in print and ebook form. Print and ebook form, and both have very, very, very different requirements in terms of layouts. Uh, a print book is laid out through by our artists. We have beautiful artists, gorgeous layouts, as fixed. These are fixed layouts. An ebook, as I'm sure you know, if you have a Kindle or an iPad, are not fixed. You can manipulate the font, you can change the size of the text. We call it dynamic text. And so there are far more constraints on a, on a book, uh, a manuscript that has to go to ebook route than a book that has to go to print route. Do we understand that? If not, please raise your hand or scream. But an ebook, because it has to be readable on a whole variety of different platforms, Apple, Samsung, Windows, you name it, Kobe, what was that thing from Barnes & Noble? Nook, right? Because it all has to be readable. It is extremely constrained in its requirements. And that's why you must abide by the FUP author guide, which hopefully we'll get a chance to briefly review today because it is extremely important. If it's not formatted accordingly, you're gonna, we're gonna have to send your manuscript back because in the past, we then went ahead and fixed those things, which became so costly that we said, no, the author, it must simply abide by these formatting guidelines. And if not, you know, we can go forward. And by the way, this applies not just to us, it applies to every other publisher who does an ebook. So you might as well be aware of that now and not have disappointments down the road, okay? Um, so let's talk about formatting right now, and then we'll break. The important thing to remember <clears throat> is that you're gonna be writing most likely in Word. Some people write in pages, which is uh, actually, I like pages, but um, 
uh, you know, Pages has an export function to EPUB, which is wonderful. That's the, the ebook. To this day, you know, I, I'm not a fan of Microsoft. Let me tell you this right now. Let me tell me honestly, I'm not a fan of Microsoft. Uh, I cannot believe after all these iterations of Microsoft Word, there's still no export function to EPUB. I cannot believe it. I cannot believe it, but there it is. Anyway, Word is Word. We got to leave it. But Word, because it has all these incredible micro functions that are hidden under the surface, you don't see it. We call it auto formatting. When you invoke auto formatting, it, it uses all kinds of hidden code that goes haywire when we move it to an ebook. Do you understand what I'm saying? Ebook needs to be flat text. Flat, we call it ASCII text. You don't know what that is. In my days, 1970s, we all knew what ASCII text was, flat text. And so whenever you use auto formatting and it gets ported into an ebook manuscript, all of a sudden you see all these weird characters, weird characters, lines, artifacts, pulls our hair out. And that's why you have no hair, as you can see. Uh, so definitely auto formatting is not allowed in terms of bulleted lists, you know, when you do a bulleted list and Microsoft Word says, oh, wait, I'll do it for you, boink, can't have it. Uh, inserting spaces between paragraphs, can't have it. So anytime you use auto formatting, turn it off. You can actually do a global turn off uh, in auto formatting. Footnotes are not allowed for the simple reason that an ebook doesn't know how to deal with that. At least not ebooks that we work with. And we, we work with multi platform ebooks. We do encourage endnotes. Okay. And what we typically encourage people to do, rather than using that little number in the text, you know, a little superscript 23, 24, 25, we don't like that because, again, an academic reader will be comfortable with that, but a general reader will not be is in your endnotes, simply recapitulate the sentence or part of the sentence to which your endnote refers. It's very simple. You, you write, you know, Williams wrote in 2012 that leadership studies should be subject to da 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 da. In your endnotes, re rewrite that sentence. Williams wrote in 2012 that da 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 da. And then you add your end note. You can do in italics or, or whatnot, whatever. You see what I'm saying? I use that in my book, uh, 10 Prayers That Changed the World, which won a Spirituality of the Year award. Da, 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 da. But uh, that's, it, it's a really wonderful way to do end notes, again, for a general reader, not for an academic reader. Anyway, um, if you want to read that book, uh, well, you see that it's called The Ten Prayers That Changed the World. There's only one book by that title. It's not just Christian book, uh, prayers. It's, it's uh, Hindu prayers. It's Jewish prayers, uh, Muslim prayers. So it's not just uh, uh, Christian stuff. Indents. You don't. This is a sin that many of you have committed. And so go to church and do penance for that after this call. Many of you make indents by hitting the tab key. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Admit it. Can't do it. Because a tab key is, again, an artifact in your ebook manuscript. So set indents globally in the uh, nav bar on top of Word. You know how to do that, right? Indent. Quarter inch indent for text indents, half inch indent for bibliography references. Let me repeat that, quarter inch indent for your main text, half inch indent for your bibliographical references, okay? It's all described in the author guide. So those are things, and it's not just for us, again, it goes for every uh, publisher that you wanna print, uh, do your ebook with, your ebook. Your book will likely be published as a soft cover, six by nine inches. That's the standard format that we use and that virtually all other publishers use because it fits on the shelf. 
uh, and uh, let's see. And uh, the problem is that you are writing your manuscript on, oh, wait, oh, okay. I see somebody activated, uh, okay. Um, chances are you're writing your manuscript on your laptop uh, on, uh, on a size eight by 11, right? If you have a Word document and you have it set at a particular page size, it's letter size, American letter size, or in Britain, maybe Australia, it's A4. Um, but that is a much bigger size than the future size of your book. Now, when you talk, talk about text, that's not such an issue, but it is an issue when you deal with certain text elements. They all have to be scalable. They have to be scalable to six by nine, page size, okay? So for example, if you wanna use pictures and we love pictures, don't get me wrong, use pictures, use illustrations, use graphs, provide it you have the rights or you ask for the rights, okay? Don't send us any pictures or illustrations that you don't own the rights of. Um, photos or those elements, should be either PNG or JPEG in black and white. It's okay if they're in color, our artists can convert them from color to black and white using a special enhancement procedure. At least six by four inches at 150 DPI. Sometimes we get pictures that are so small that if we print them in a book, they will become pixelated. You know. Uh, many of these are old pictures taken with a cell phone or with a really crappy little camera. So obviously we want the book to look good. So if you use photos or illustrations or graphs, they have to be at least six by four inches at a minimum 150 DPI and formatted either JPEG or PNG. If you don't know what that is or if you need help, we can always talk once we if we want to do your book, then we can always have a conversation uh, about that. All those pictures should be included in the text in line with text. So if you put the picture in your book where you want it to appear in the manuscript, in your Word document, place it right there as in line with text, not as a floating image, because then it starts to drift around the entire manuscript and we don't know what's going to happen. Each image, each figure, each graphic, each graph, each everything that is not text needs to have a caption. And, uh, and you have that caption and that caption should cite the source. Laurie has a question. Go ahead, Laurie. Um, quick question. And I think I may have discussed this with you before. Now, um, the participants from my study of my dissertation, of course, I did get permission to use their photos. Um, but I'm going to assume that now I'll need to go back to them and get another permission if I wanted to use their photos for the book. Yes, it is a good question, Lori, thank you. Um, and it applies not just to illustrations, it also applies to, for example, if you uh, cited a respondent in your dissertation by her or his actual name, uh, then you have to go back to those respondents and say, hey, guess what? Uh, work of my research is being published as a book. I just want to make sure that I can use your name again. Most often, dissertations will use a pseudonym for respondents. Your IRB probably made sure of that. But anything that's related uh, to your respondents that somehow makes it possible for people to identify the identity of that respondent, you should go back and make sure that's okay. Same with pictures, yes. I think that would be a good idea. If they gave you permission for your dissertation, I think chances are good that they will give you permission for the book. However, a book is a different animal than a dissertation. A dissertation is typically published 
as part of a uh, academic, like ProQuest, an academic platform for academics only. And now you're publishing a book that the general reader will be able to see. So it's a, we call it different use in uh, legally in the publishing world. So yes, I would encourage you to go back and uh, ask for their permission. Okay, any other questions about this? And then finally, whatever images you use in the manuscript, you have to place it in the manuscript. So our uh, layout artists will know, and even whatever publisher you use will know where that image you go. You also have to deliver it separately in its highest revolution, resolution, uh, because in the layout process, believe it or not, uh, text and images get separated and they have to be imported afresh. The reason is that, again, because of the scalable scaling of your eight by 10 text to six by nine text, the flow of your pages will be different. And so if you, if you placed your image right on the cusp of a page change and it turns out differently in a six by nine size, then the artists need to have the flexibility to place that image somewhere close by, but somewhere differently than in your manuscript. I know it's technical stuff, but these are challenges that we deal with every, every day. Uh, here is a typical example of a, of a word table. And a word table, and I know many of you guys love word tables. I have yet to see a dissertation without a word table. I don't know why you guys love that so much, but word tables are the, are the, uh, the flavor there. But word tables cannot be used. Uh-oh, word tables are not scalable. When you take a word table and you shrink it, try it out, and you shrink it to a smaller size, can be scaled. All Everything gets scrambled. That's why I hate Word. <laughs> and I hate Word tables even more. Uh, so sometimes what you can do, if you have a table that you absolutely have, have to have, is you can do a screenshot. What you do is you blow up that table on your screen as big as it will go, and then you do a screen capture, and then you get a PNG graphic, and then you can clean up the stuff around it you know, by cropping it out, and then we can use it. The only thing to remember is that your resolution will suffer. So it can only be used in rare instances where your table is truly essential and where you can deliver that table as a PNG or a JPEG at, at good resolution. So in some, we strongly discourage the use of word tables in your manuscript. We really, really do, okay? All right, I think this is a good point. Oh, one more thing, bibliography. Don't copy your entire bibliography. I've seen people who write an article about their dissertation, and then they add the entire bibliography. Sometimes the bibliography is longer than their article. Again, it's not about impressing people. It really isn't. We're not impressed by all the things you've read. What we need to see is a select bibliography that is directly pertinent to the material in your manuscript. That's really what we're talking about, folks. So uh, don't do that. Don't copy the entire bibliography. When you have URLs or DOIs in your bibliography, make sure they're still active. <laughs> Click on them uh, and make sure it doesn't go to page not found, all you know, the horrible thing we always see when we go to those things, page not found. If that's the case, take it out. So make sure to test those URLs and DOIs and never, never, never allow them in the main body of your text, only in your bibliography. Okay, this is where we're going to take a break. I'm gonna make, shall we do make a five minute because we're running a little late on time. Shall we make it a five minute break? Okay, just run, get your coffee or tea in my case, and we'll resume in five minutes. And now we're gonna talk about which publishers are willing and able and ready to publish your work. So we talked about Feeling University Press. 
Now we're talking about all the other opportunities you have to publish your work, okay? I'm going to pause recording and we will be back in resuming, okay? We are, we have resumed our recording. I hope you all got your coffee or your tea. <clears throat> <clears throat> and uh, let's get through this section uh, quickly so we can talk about uh, your particular questions. Okay, independent publishing. This is uh, a, a great subject because we're talking about opportunities for you to publish your dissertation as a book in ways that were not possible just a few years ago. Uh, you have a tremendous amount of opportunities to publish your work uh, electronically or in print form uh, in many ways and sometimes without it costing you a cent. So there is really no reason why each and every one of you cannot publish your dissertation. And that's what I always tell my students. I say, there is no more excuse to not publishing your dissertation. We're going to talk about eBooks and then we're going to talk about print books. And of course, uh, those who do print books will also do eBooks. But those who do eBooks may not also do print books. So that's why we could talk about electronic books first. Electronic books, I'm sure you're familiar with it, are books that you can download instantly. You can read them on your iPad, on your Kindle, on your computer, on your iPhone. A lot of people read books on their iPhone um, and they're simply electronic books. Uh, it doesn't require stocking or inventory or print costs. It's just instantly downloadable, which is why it is so popular. The leading electronic publishers in, in the United States, now this is my selection, you can probably find more, but these are some of the, what I consider the most important ones, is Amazon KDP, previously known as CreateSpace, now known as Amazon KDP, uh, and you can see the URLs. This, uh, this PowerPoint will be posted on the alumni website so that you can uh, get this PowerPoint and click on the links and you can look for themselves. Uh, Smash words, we will look at each of these. Uh, Amazon KDP uses a format called Mobi, which is only readable on Amazon devices as well as Amazon apps. So what Amazon publishes in Mobi can only be read on Kindle apps as well as Kindle devices, okay? The rest of the world uses a ebook format standard called EPUB, electronic publishing, EPUB, which is not compatible with Kindle. And EPUBs are used by the whole Apple ecosphere iPads primarily. I'm a big EPUB uh, reader on my iPad. I, I don't like the Kindle uh, flash or the, the, the shift. I like the way that on an Apple device, when you read an Apple ebook, you actually curl the page. I like it for some I'm old fashioned. What do you want? You know, that's what I do. Um, Barnes and Noble, they are sort of a Johnny come lately. But you know they always try to catch up with what other people are doing. They tried for a very long time to sell their platform called the Nook. That is basically falling by the wayside. There's not a whole lot of activity anymore around the Nook. Uh, but they still publish themselves eBooks called Barnes and Noble Press. And then there is a, a Japanese Canadian consortium called Rakuten Kobo. They're Canadian. They tend to be a little bit more international. Now, having said that, of course, we all know that Amazon is all over the world as well. Um, but um, you know, they are specifically geared to that market. Rakuten Kobo. Virtually all of these distributors, that's really what they are, 
uh, formatters and distributors will offer somewhere around 70% of royalties if your ebook is priced between $2.99 and $9.99. Amazon will sometimes demand that your ebook is priced higher, uh, but by and large, you get 70% of the world, which is really good. That's the good news. The bad news is, of course, that ebooks are priced very, very low. Uh, typically, uh, an ebook in our market is priced $9.99, 10 bucks. So that you, if somebody buys your book after the deduction of distribution costs, you wind up, wind up somewhere between five and six bucks for books, which is a reasonable, that's not to, nothing to uh, you know, be ashamed about, but that's sort of the dynamic of an ebook. Minimum requirements are a Word document in the DocX format and a cover image. We'll talk about cover images in a minute. Okay, so these are ebooks, ebook distributors. Here is the Kindle. The interface of Amazon Kindle is not very user friendly. And um, I would sort of discourage you from using Amazon Kindle unless you're really savvy with uh, formatting for the Kindle. Uh, it's not terribly user friendly. Create Space, the previous incarnation of Amazon Kindle, was so much better. Their support was better, their customer service was better. Uh, Amazon basically took it in house and screwed it up. So Amazon Kindle is really for more experienced uh, folks who are hip with formatting Word documents and, and so forth. Uh, can't really call it my number one at all. It is to be recommended if you want to use both print and ebook at the same time, if you want to publish both as a printed book and an ebook at the same time. But then again, to do a printed book with Amazon KDP, you have to be really smart and really format their templates, which are not easy to use. Um, a much better ebook distributor, I think, is Smashwords, smashwords.com. Uh, and they, as you can see, publish not only to the Amazon ecosphere, they publish to uh, a whole bunch of people, Barnes & Noble, Apple, Kobo, all the things that I mentioned earlier, FNAC in France, very big distributing, this distributor, Livaria Cultura, the UK, the Hive. So I really like uh, Smashwords. If your obje objective is to first publish your book as an ebook without it costing you anything other than maybe copy editing, we talked about copy editing in the previous seminar. I think copy editing is a must. Uh, you really should have another set of eyes to look at your language because you're blind. I mean, when you write, sometimes you're, I, I always insist. Uh, on using a copy editor and my publishers insist because I, even though I'm an experienced writer, that you, you sometimes you, you misspell or you, your grammar is such and you, because you've written it, you don't see it. So always, always use a copy editor. If you need a copy editor, you don't know how do you, we have access to copy editors that work at very affordable rates, somewhere along the lines of a penny a word, a penny a word. So um, strongly recommend that you use a copy editor before you publish your work. But once you publish your work and you just want to have an ebook right now to start with, Smashwords is your way to go. You upload your Word document, you upload a cover image, and that's it. And by the end of the day, by the end of tonight, you could be published. It's that simple. They have an algorithm that formats your Word document into something uh, that, uh, that looks like a, a professional ebook, and off you go. Of course, you should make your own title page and all, all that good stuff. Uh, that's, that's Smashwords. And you get 
uh, of royalties from major ebook retailers and 80% list at others uh, that they distribute to. So an average of 70%, which is, which is pretty good. Um, Barnes and Noble Press, again, it's sort of a copycat, sort of me too format. Uh, but the, the good news is you're being published by uh, a big publisher, Barnes and Noble. Okay, they have their own publishing imprints. Uh, and you, again, you pick your format, you upload your files, and you sell your book. Bang, that's it. Uh, if it's just electronic book, there is no cost involved. If it's print books, there is a cost potentially involved, just as there is with other publishers who do print books, as we will see uh, in a moment. So Smashwords would be my first choice. Um, Barnes and Noble Press, not a bad, not a bad way, way to go either. Uh, and then there is Kobo, which is this uh, Japanese um, uh, Canadian format. Uh, they are a little bit more idiosyncratic, but they do have a very strong loyal following. Uh, so it's a lesser known distributor of ebooks, but with a quite a fanatic following. And again, as I said, they're more internationally oriented. So if you think your book has uh, potential in the uh, international world, then Kobo uh, is definitely something you should take a look at. In fact, you should take a look at all four of these and, and make up your own mind. I mean, these are just recommendations I'm giving you. Um, and you know they have things like podcasts that talk about, uh, I don't like the word self-publishing, I call it independent publishing. Um, there are social platforms you can get involved with. So they sort of try to make it, uh, create a support system for you, <clears throat> as it were, through uh, these particular platforms. So those are the ones that I would recommend if you want to go the ebook route and only the ebook route with a closed purse. So, in a sense, that other than copy editing, which is your responsibility, that, that won't cost you anything. Smash words won't cost you a dime. Okay, that's ebooks. Now we're going to talk about print books. The advantage of print books over ebooks is the fact that you get a physical book, you can touch it, you can hold it. You can take it to a conference. You can have book signings. You can give it as gifts to people with your autograph. Uh, there are so many advantages to having a printed book. In addition to the fact that in the academic uh, area, in the academic field, which is very conservative, uh, a printed book tends to be appreciated more than an ebook. You know, an ebook is so well, you know, okay, but a printed book. You know, you're on Amazon, you're on Amazon page, you have a printed book, you can click on it, you can buy, you can, two days, you can get it. Uh, a print book is really a more prestigious way to go. And of course, the best of all worlds is to do both. And all of these people that you see here, all of these organizations. Again, this is my selection. There are many more of these publishing platforms, but this is my recommendation. Uh, that you look at. And three out of these four, I have actually done work with. So I can speak somewhat from experience. So we're gonna look at each of these four publishers, okay? This is for independent publishing, where they publish your book uh, without question. Uh, they will publish your book and put it in basically the same distribution stream that your commercial publishers do, your big four. Um, if you publish a book with them, it will show up on Amazon, it will show up on Barnes and Noble, uh, and they can even, if you, people go to a store and ask, uh, hey, um, Anita published a book and you ordered, they can order it for you. They may not carry it on the shelf, but they can order it for that customer. Shelf space today is becoming extremely difficult in bookstores. So getting your book in a bookstore 
is difficult under any circumstance. I have published books with major publishers and not seen it on a bookshelf because bookstores are competing with the online world. And so they're limiting their bookshelf space to really only top, top, top best-selling authors. That's just the way it works, folks. Uh, so that's a major reason why the advantage of selling with, uh, of publishing with a major book publisher is really less than it used to be. When you published with National Geographic or somebody like that, which I've done many times, you were guaranteed, virtually guaranteed, a space on a bookshelf and a major book retailer. But book, book retailers themselves have fallen by the wayside. You know, um, so many book retailers like Barnes and Noble, like others, have simply disappeared. We had the Barnes and Noble in, in Santa Monica, it just went away. Because so many more books are sold today through the online world than bookshops. I, I, I hate, I love browsing in bookshops, but they just have very limited shelf space. So Lulu is a very reputable distributor for independent publishing. Basically, uh, you decide uh, what your cover looks like, and they have templates where you can do that. Uh, they, you can choose a template for the way your print book looks like, the font, the layout, the style. You can choose all that, and then based on that, uh, they will publish your book on what is called print on demand, which means it's a system that prints your book when an order comes in. The traditional way of publishing a book is that publishers print a run of, let's say, 3,500 or 5,000 copies. That's sort of the average. And uh, so they sit with that stack of printed books, and then they have to push it out to the publishers or to the Amazons of the world in the hope that these books actually get sold. Most cases that inventory does not get sold, it gets shipped back to the publisher and pulped. That's right, it gets pulped. So it's not a very eco-friendly way of publishing uh, because at the end of the day, you wind up with a whole stack of books uh, that are not sold and that have to be pulped uh, and hopefully recycled uh, or simply destroyed. And that's why print on demand is a system whereby your book is, pub is printed the minute somebody actually buys it and it's instantaneous. In the beginning, there was a quality concern about these printed books. But let me tell you, um, here is a... Here is a, a book, one of my books, that uh, is published using print on demand and it has full page color illustrations, beautiful layouts. You cannot distinguish this book from uh, a book used using the old uh, offset printing process. There is no distinction. Uh, you can do hardcover, you can do soft cover. Of course, there are cost elements there. But if you want to do a hardcover, which is even more prestigious, you can do that. So that's Lulu. And uh, a very similar service, uh, which is, I, I would say, definitely uh, preferable for if you have many illustrations, is Blurb. I have done tests with both Lulu and Blurb. Both the quality is uh, very comparable, but Blurb tends to move towards um, illustrated books. If you want to have a lot of pictures, you can see that right here on this homepage, their homepage. They uh, really, their unique specialty is making professional quality photo books. So if you have heavy illustrations, uh, Blurb is the way to go. And as you can see here, this is the same for Lulu, by the way. They offer you various choices, your basic six by nine trade book, standard at uh, uh, a cost of 325 each. 
uh, your premium paperback with uh, better quality binding, size options for 40 per print book, um, professional hardcover books with dust jackets, photo books, la di da di da, all with different pr uh, price sizes. And then there is typically a setup charge for the layout and so forth. But uh, a wonderful way to get uh, your book in a variety of formats and sizes into the marketplace in a way that is uh, indistinguishable from uh, a commercial publisher, soft cover, or hardcover. Now, this is new. This is entirely new, and I haven't yet had a chance to test them, but I wanted to share this with you. This is called uh, Draft to Draft to Digital. Yeah, draft to Digital. I'm sorry. Uh, my, my bar was covering it up. And this is entirely um, driven by artificial intelligence. Now, what makes that so special is that you can do a printed book and an ebook at no cost. Let me say that again. You can do a print book and an ebook at no cost. It's brand new. It is entirely robot. It's robots doing it for you, artificial intelligence. So as they say, we charge no fee for formatting or distributing a book. What they do is they take 10% of the retail price, whatever retail price you set for each sale. So print on demand, but they only make money when you make money. All the upfront costs, they absorb. That's how KDP used to work. KDP now has so many requirements that you, you almost are forced to use a professional layout artist and a professional design artist to get it done. But uh, this is very exciting. Now, again, caveat, I haven't tested it out yet because it's so new, but it certainly behooves you to take a look at it. Make as many changes as you want. You can update the cover. You can update the, your distribution, your book, your choice, whatever. You have complete freedom and control of your printed and your ebook. And there are no upfront publishing or production costs. Very exciting. Uh, it's the first in its kind, but again, it is all based on artificial intelligence. It has promotions utility, which I think is very exciting. It has uh, book tabs and other tools for keeping tabs on the sales of your books. And you can, for a fee, schedule promotions. Uh, so you can you know, power your releases uh, with uh, various tools that they have. But if you don't wanna do that, in principle, it's possible to publish your book both print and ebook completely free. And then you, uh, so you get royalties on the back end, uh, which are very exciting. And they only take 10% cut. Uh, I don't think that's sustainable in the long run. I think this is just their <clears throat> promotional activity to take away market share from Amazon, Lulu, and Blurb. I think eventually, they will have to start charging more in terms of the back end that they participating in. 10% is simply not sustainable. But while it lasts, while not uh, take use of it, make use of it, right? So that is, uh, and again, there are some more things about some of the unique things they have. So in a sum, these are the distribution channels. And most of these distributors obviously use Amazon, it owns 42% of the US print book market and 89% of the US ebook market. So all of these people that we just talked about obviously use Amazon, but they also use others like Barnes and Noble and Apple iBooks. Apple iBooks not only accounts for 6% of ebook sales, much to my regret because I'm a big Apple iBook aficionado. Uh, there's 
bookstore, retail, online channels, university libraries, school libraries, public libraries, all included in these distribution channels. And there is a little, very scary to see the share of Amazon of the book market uh, and others. All right, 10 steps of writing your book. This is just a recap, your first draft, feedback, share it with friends and family, colleagues, get feedback, write your final draft. Writing is rewriting, another mantra of mine. I typically go through five drafts before I submit a manuscript to my publishers. That's a, writing is rewriting. Copy edit, gotta do it, gotta bite that bullet. If you need help, I, can, I have access to copy editors that can work for a very affordable fee, penny a word. Manuscript lock, no more changes. Then you go into layout, you submit to the printer publisher, you proof copies, your ebook development, and your publication. Okay. All of the, these steps from number five onwards are handled by these facilitators that we just talked about. Um, and they're also done by Fielding, if you decided to press, uh, publish with Fielding University Press. Peer review factor. Again, ask your external examiner or any other expert you know in your field to write a brief forward. It gives you credibility. It gives you support. Ask your chair to write a brief introduction. So in addition to a preface, have another endorsement in the form of your chair writing a two, three page introduction. And then finally, have Lulu blurb or draft to digital create the layouts for you. You can use your own layout using templates such as these templates from KDP, but I do not recommend it. You really have to be a very, very strong word user to manage those templates. I don't like them. You can also engage an artist to do the layouts for you but that's very expensive. And I would only encourage you to do that if you have very specific requirements. For example, here is an example from a layout that we produced for one of our FUP books by one of our artists. And if you have two column text with images that go across both columns or per column each, yeah, you need an artist to do that. But most of you will not do that. And finally, the cover. The cover is something that um, your distributor will may do for you, but your cover is your selling point. You know, everything is sold by the cover. Um, you know, it's so important that you have a compelling cover. And so for all of these three, we use professional artists to create that. It's very difficult to do that yourself. I have seen some absolutely horrible covers being produced by the authors themselves who independently publish or self-publish. Don't do that, please. Unless you have a schooling or a background in art and graphics, just ask a artist to do that for you. And there are so many artists out there uh, on Yelp and other neighborhood uh, websites like that, who for a few hundred dollars will create a very compelling cover for you. Again, as I said, Blurb, Lulu, draft to digital have templates, but I th think that it could be personal. It should be totally optimized to fit your need, your book, your identity. And so for that, I would suggest that you use a professional art. And that is my story. We'll stop share. And now, hit me with questions. Open mic. Go ahead. I have a question for you, John Pierre. All right. Do you uh, uh, do you use Microsoft Word for your manuscripts, or do you use some other software? No, I have to use Microsoft Word because my publisher expects me to use Microsoft Word. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We I have, uh, and I, I hate it. Uh, uh, I've said some nasty curse words uh, with Word. You know, it crashes a lot. 
if you have large manuscripts, uh, word is very non-logical and non-intuitive, but I have no choice. I have to use word. And we at Finley University Press also uh, uh, require word. Tulani. Hi there, so good to see you. Good to um, see you. Thank you so much for this information. So quick question for you. I've literally just spent thousands of dollars with a publisher. Um, it's, I mean, I'm actually paying them to help publish my book and it's, but they've not provided me with copy editing, design. Um, I've literally had to take care of all of that on my own. And I just wanted to find out, is that a normal thing um, to, to, to pay for, they're a non-traditional publisher based in London, to pay thousands of dollars and then you have to actually do all of the work yourself? Um, I'm just curious to know. Yeah, I'm afraid you have fallen for one of the more predatory publishers that are out there that promise to do those things and then hit you up with those costs. So it is extremely important that uh, whenever you get an offer, and, and I know, I mean, I get offers all the time from publishers, quote unquote, mm -hmm. say, oh, we want to publish your book. You know, it's very important that before you sign anything with these publishers, that you get a complete rundown of what do they take care of and what are your responsibilities, particularly as it relates to um, such things as copy editing. Uh, any publisher worth uh, its salt should take care. I mean, I'm talking about commercial publishers now. Sure, sure. Um, if, if a publisher like Walter Mifflin or Sage or Feeling University Press um, offers to publish your work, the publisher takes responsibility for the copy editing, in my experience. Yeah. Now, there's lots of gray areas because it's become such a wild west out there in terms of publishing. And yeah, there are many uh, publishers out there who promise to publish your work and then you get hit with many hidden fees. So it's absolutely uh, not the way of doing things in the publishing world. And they should have given you full disclosure uh, of those costs right from the get go. You know, it's, I'm sorry to hear that Tulani because I'm, I remember last time we talked, you mentioned that you had a publisher and I was so excited for you, but yeah, then, then comes the nightmare <laughs> Then it becomes a nightmare. Yeah. So whatever you do, even with the publishers that I just reviewed, you always say upfront, tell me exactly what costs are involved in publishing my book with you, absolutely. Thank you, Jean-Pierre. Thank you, Tulani. Good luck with that. Thanks. Get me a copy though, so I can write a review. Yes, I will. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, Kathy. I better, oh, I'm off mute, okay. Thank you, Jean-Pierre. I really appreciate your sessions. Um, I'm not sure what I was looking up on my computer but I have now become inundated with writing coaches and self-publishing companies. And this may relate to Talani's um, question as well. What do you have to say about some of these folks? Um, there's a Chandler Bolt, there's a Jenny Nash. I, I, they, I don't know how they hooked up to, and I'm not sure what I looked up on my computer, but now I'm getting emails from all of these folks. Yeah, it's, uh, as I said, it's, it's a predatory world out there and people have latched on to the academic world as a potential market uh, for getting work published uh, and they want to make money. I mean, um, that's why I was so excited to see draft to digital because here is a publisher who says right up front, it's not going to cost you anything. We're going to take, we're going to take our share of the back end. Um, there are many, many predatory publishers out there. Uh, sometimes they look at ProQuest and they see whenever somebody publishes a new dissertation on ProQuest, you know, as part of the graduation procedure, they fired off an email to get you. I had heard many other horror stories about people who went 
uh, uh, with a publisher like that, or at least a pretend publisher like that, and then got stuck with uh, costs or very limited distribution using only their website, for example. Some of them are self-publishing, teaching you how to do self-publishing, and some of them are quote unquote um, writing coaches to help you sort through how you're going to be expressing yourself. Exactly. And so I, the, the, that's why the, the publishers I just mentioned to you are ones that I've worked with myself. And that I, so I've gone through the whole process with them as part of uh, the Feeling University Press research uh, before I actually, with Katrina, set up Feeling University Press now, what, seven, nine years ago. We did tests with all of those publishers to see what they're able to do. And so um, those I can, I can recommend. Uh, all these other ones, you, know, the, you also have to worry about what is going to be the imprint? And um, in other words, what's going to go on your book as the publisher? And what I would recommend, even if you self-publish, quote unquote, um, give yourself an imprint, um, call it, uh, you know, Lotus Publishing. You know, you don't care, you know, give your, yourself a name for tax reasons, for no other reasons, you know, set yourself up as a as a S corporation or an LLC. Give yourself a lofty name, you know, um, whatever it is, leadership publishing. Give it a name or a favorite flower or a favorite dog or whatever it is. <laughs> set it up, and so on the back of your book, it's so published by da 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 publishing, rather than published by Kathy Edelman. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So you take away this, this sting of a self-publishing book by, um, by giving yourself, setting yourself up as a publisher. I have a publishing arm called Pantheon Publishing. Uh, when I want to do things that I don't want to do anyway else, uh, I pu I've published some books under Pantheon Publishing, and uh, it's perfect. And I got book reviews, and, you know, there's absolutely, there's no stigma uh, attached to uh, and I, I say that because the stigma that used to be attached to self-publishing or vanity publishing, as it was called many decades ago, is all but disappeared. I mean, you can independently publish and, and get book reviews, no problem. But by setting yourself up, whether you actually incorporate or not, doesn't really matter. For the sake of your publisher that you work with, he will ask you, do you have an imprint? do develop an imprint that is, is uniquely yours and that sort of uh, makes presents you as a authority uh, to the outside world. Okay. Whatever you do, do your research. So you, before you sign with any of these publishers, do your research, talk to a customer representative. Don't just be put off by a Q&A, you know, frequently ask questions, no? If you want to go into the boat with them, then you want to know what they're about. So do your research, Google them. Uh, I, I always do a Google search complaints about fill in the number, you fill in the name, you know. And so you get to know them. And, uh, you know, that's that would be my recommendation. Uh, let's Thank see. you. Jennifer. Hi, thank you for this. I'm really excited to go back and watch the first two seminars. Um, I'm wondering about copyright issues. If you publish with Amazon, which of course we wouldn't because you don't recommend it, but if we were to do that, then could we go on and publish it another way in print or electronically? See, that that's a very good question. And uh, that's where the rubber meets the road. Thank you for doing uh, asking that question because I, I forgot to address it. Uh, there are copyright uh, uh, limitations with Amazon. Absolutely. Amazon does not want you to publish with somebody else that same book uh, if, if you've published with them. Draft to Digital does not. Uh, and my understanding is that the other ones, Lulu and Blurb, do not either. They don't claim exclusivity. Uh, now, in the interest of uh, full disclosure, Feeling University Press asks for an exclusivity for at least three years so that we are able to recoup our costs, basically. It's a little bit different for a small publisher like ourselves because we invest a lot of money 
and publishing our books. And uh, while you know our motive is not to make a lot of money, we're not profit oriented. We are a not for profit university. I, we do for our board of trustees want to make sure that we can uh, demonstrate that we can, at the very least, recover most of our costs. And so we ask you, if you publish with us, that you do not publish that same work or a similar work uh, in the marketplace for at least three years. You can excerpt. Uh, I've had people ask me, um, I've been asked to do an article based on my book. Is that allowed in an article in an academic journal? Of course, that's allowed. But when these things happen, do write to me and we, we will work something out that works for both of us so that it doesn't impinge on our ability to recover the costs and it gives you the rights to help promote the book, for example, by publishing a digest in an academic journal, absolutely. But um, again, with commercial publishers, the answer is absolutely no. <laughs> and with uh, independent publishing platforms, in most cases, the answer is yes. You, you retain, they only ask for non-exclusive distribution rights. Good question. Thank so that you. means you can take the exact same book if there's not exclusivity or when Fielding's exclusivity runs out when we're using them, we can take that exact same book and republish it? That's right. Okay, thank you we, so much. We prefer not to, of course. We hope that you will work with us on maybe doing a new edition of your work. But in principle, that's that's how, how uh, things go. Um, Could I jump in for a minute and ask a follow-up question on that? Sure. Uh, did I hear you just say that if you publish in an academic journal, uh, you can still go ahead and use that in a book? Or is well, that... Not the verbatim article, of course, but oh, okay. You know, but what I have seen several times is our authors, not just alumni, but also faculty, coming back to me and say, "Look, we published this book about. I'm just going to say something sustainability. Uh, I would like to use a digest, not the entire verbatim article, but essentially a digest of that book into a journal article. Uh, and of course, then the answer is yes, because no matter what, you always retain the underlying rights to your research. No matter who publishes you, you own your research. Nobody will take that away from you. It's just that we've invested an awful lot of money in the copy editing, the layout, the artists, the cover, the publishing process, and we just need a reasonable time to recover those costs. But if you produce, if you say, I want to make an article out of my book. I do want to basically create a digest, distill an article about my book and then refer to my book in an academic journal in a sense of saying, you know, if you want to see the full, the full material, you know, refer to so-and-so by Feeling University Press, then of course we want to work with you on that. Not, any, not many publishers will do that, by the way. But you will always, no matter what, always retain the underlying copyright to your data and your research. No publisher can take that away from you. Now, there's another thing I should mention on that is that <clears throat> feeling requires you to publish your work on ProQuest as a way of <clears throat> making your distribution, your, your uh, dissertation available to the world. Um, I once actually uh, got into a legal uh, dispute with them because when we started to feel the university press, they were claiming exclusivity. And uh, legally, we've been able to demonstrate that they do not have exclusivity. The only exclusivity they have to your dissertation is the unique UMI code that they give to your dissertation in their particular ecosystem, their particular database. That's the only thing they have exclusivity for. So even if your dissertation is published by ProQuest, you still have the full and unencumbered right to publish your dissertation, hopefully though, in a newly written form as we discussed, but anyway, you still own the rights to that dis dissertation. Okay, let's see, uh, David. Uh, thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Professor. I was just wondering about if you publish with the Fielding Publishing House, 
do the, does fielding retain the rights internationally? Because I've, I've thought sometimes you could publish, like say in the United States with one publisher, a different publisher overseas. I was just wondering how that works for fielding. Yes, we publish internationally. In fact, um, we had a, a really good year. I cannot disclose numbers, but um, well, I can say this, we sold over a thousand copies of our books last year and about 35% came from international markets. So we're becoming very strong internationally. We're gaining a reputation on the strength of the work by authors like you. And we're terribly excited about that. That doesn't include eBooks. We sold a ton of eBooks last year. So we're growing as a publisher. Are we gaining a very good reputation in academia as well as in professional circles? And of course, we want to encourage that. So yes, with Field University Press, you publish uh, worldwide. Uh, and uh, it, it helps that Amazon now has printing plants in the UK, Germany, France, Italy, Spain, Japan, with China coming up real soon. So we can not only offer printed books in those local markets, but also offer ebooks basically around the world. I mean, we have ebook sales in Africa, you know, for example, where um, um, printed books of any kind are sometimes difficult to acquire simply because of the infrastructure of those third world nations. But ebooks, of course, are instantly downloadable through the online systems that exist. So we've seen a tremendous growth in the international market. And so you, with us, you will, you will publish globally. Uh, there are indeed publishers in the United States that segment out the United States, but then still retain worldwide rights that they sell to international publishers. Okay. Uh -huh. So now you, that happened with my book, uh, several of my National Geographic books. For example, I was, a, I was shooting a, a TV series about Vincent van Gogh last year and I walked into, uh, with my crew, into uh, an old monastery where we filmed. And um, I saw in their gift shop uh, a French edition of my book, The Biblical World. I didn't even know that they had sold the French rights uh, by Hachette. So here was uh, Le Monde Biblique. And uh, it's funny because <laughs> I, I took the book <clears throat> and I, I paid for it, and I said to the French lady, uh, "Moi, je suis l'auteur," and and she didn't believe me. She says, "No, c'est pas vrai, c'est pas vrai, c'est pas possible." I said, "No, no, je suis l'auteur," and I had to show my passport, <laughs> and the book, and leave <laughs> the show. And when they, she discovered that I was the author, she called everybody in the whole monastery. Everybody had to come out and shake hands. <laughs> And I had to sign all the books in their inventory. <laughs> so, but uh, as an example, uh, I wasn't even aware that National Geographic had sold the rights. They sold the rights to Spain. They sold the rights to Italy and so forth and so on. So even though they say they publish in North America, they will typically retain the rights and then sell it off to others. So that's another layer of lesser royalties that you will receive. With us, you receive your 50% after we recoup you receive the 50% regardless of whether we sell in Africa, in, uh, in, in France, Germany, England, or, uh, or Australia, for example. We had, we're getting very good sales in Australia, thanks to our authors. Thank All you, right, we're coming, we're coming to the end of our show. Uh, are there any other questions I have not? I'm looking at the hands raised here. Any other urgent questions I can answer for you for the last few minutes we have? Go ahead. Yes, Anita. Oh, you gotta take yourself off mute. Hmm? Voila. Uh, something that you mentioned earlier, uh, after recouping costs, I'm wondering if there is a chance that we go through onto open source courseware. At the university in California, our business department has made large commitments to using open source 
texts and courseware, especially trying to be more inclusive of students that are working on a minimum budget. Is there a chance that any of the books produced through the fielding press would go that route after they recoup costs? Well, we do, um, we do follow the open access format in a sense that uh, most academic books in the area in which we publish are priced at $80 not dollars or more. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, when we book, um, uh, we, we, we just published an entirely new edition of the uh, online, the handbook of online learning, uh, which was previously published by Sage at a very substantial price. Mm -hmm. uh, we decided to publish at a substantially lower price according to open access principles. So whereas a typical book that we publish would normally be priced at $79 or $89, we publish it at $24.95, mm -hmm. uh, which is the minimum we can do to still be able to recoup. If there was a foundation that funded all of our publishing activity, we can go to open source, but unfortunately we're not there yet. And so we have to be able to be valid and, um, and operational as a publisher feasible. We have to uh, charge some rate, some price for our books. Otherwise we simply couldn't be doing what we're doing. But we have made the decision together with the president Katrina Rogers to substantially reduce the cost of our books, not price it at the academic level, but price it at a retail level of 24.95. And that's, I mean, obviously our recoup rate is slower that way. We could make a lot more money by charging more, but we don't because exactly as you say, we want to be affordable to the vast majority of readers out there, students, as well as the general reader. Thank you. All right, with that, uh, Elena, do you have any closing, closing words? Thank you so much, Jean-Pierre, and thank you for giving additional 27 minutes of your time today. Um, our next workshop is in December. Alumni, as I'm put in the chat, please, uh, when you consider year-end gifts, when you consider any philanthropy, please support uh, Fielding, please support the Jean-Pierre Endowed Fund for Lifelong Learning so we can publish more books, potentially in the future have them in open access, and also Lots of upcoming events, virtually and in person. All of it is posted on alumni.fielding.edu. Uh, we'll be updating um, this video and the slides. Uh, you'll get access to them by email, uh, and it, they will also be posted on alumni.fielding.edu, as well as Fielding's YouTube channel, very vibrant YouTube channel with plenty of workshops, presentations by Dr. Esbots, and many more. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Take care. Bye-bye.